All righty, so let's get started. Thank you for joining us today, everybody. This is the LIHEX Tips and Tricks by Michael Ice. So we're going to have um, Robert Gabriel with us today. He's the um, president and CEO of MicroEyes Technology. And we're also going to have um, myself, Kim Kuzak, I'm a product expert, and Yasmin Yasser, a regulatory compliance specialist. So before we get started, we do have um, a quick disclaimer. MicroEyes can't be held responsible for any information you'll be learning. You're responsible to verify the accuracy of all the material presented. And MicroEyes can't be held liable for any loss of revenue and or cost you might incur by following this. So we always just recommend that you do some uh, research on your own to make sure that um, anything that may apply to you does. So today, our overview is going to be secondary billing overview, useful payment reports, understanding NIPs, and then um, at the end, we'll have time for a Q&A. So we're actually going to be starting with the NIPs information, which uh, Yasmin is going to take the lead on. Uh, so Yasmin, if you... Um, want to unmute yourself and uh, introduce yourself and all that. Hey, everyone. Thank you, Kim. Hey, everyone. This is Yasmin. I'm the MIF specialist from MicroWise. And today we're going to have a brief overview about the traditional MIPS pathway. So first, we're going to start with the agenda of our what we're going to discuss today. First, we're going to start uh, taking a look of what is MIPS. And then we're going to check to see how to determine and whether you are eligible for MIPS reporting or not. Afterwards, we're going to check what are the MIPS categories that you will be required to report on. And finally, we will see how Medisoft and LightTech will help you in reporting and would actually make your reporting process really easy. Okay, so you might have heard the two terms MIPS and MACRA, and this might have confused you. So in order to avoid any confusion, uh, let us first be clear that MACRA is the big program and MIPS is part of it. But since most of the clinicians are eligible to report uh, on MIPS, the traditional MIPS, so these days the two terms MIPS and MACRA are used interchangeably. So don't feel confused when you hear either of the terms. Okay, so what does MACRA stand for? First, MACRA uh, stands for Medicare Access and Chip Authorization Act of 2015, and it is a bar partition legislation signed into law on April 16 of 2015. There are different pathways in MACRA that are available. The one that we are discussing today is the traditional MIPS, and this is the one that is most common. Afterwards, we've got the alternative payment models. This is less common than the traditional MIPS, but it is also reported on by a lot of clinicians. And finally, we've got the MIPS value pathways. Uh, this pathway is still not applied yet. It will uh, begin to be applied in the year of 2023. All right, so how to determine whether you are eligible for MIPS or not? There are various steps you gotta follow to check your eligibility. The first step is you gotta see whether you belong to any of the following clinician types. They are, if you are, or a physician, including doctors of medicine, osteopathy, dental surgery, dental medicine, podiatric medicine, optometry, osteopathic practitioners, chiropractors, phys physician assistants, nurse practitioners, clinical nurse specialists, certified registered nurse anesthetists, physical therapists, occupational therapists, clinical psychologists, qualified speech language pathologists, qualified audiologists, registered dietitians or nutrition professionals. And these two are newly added this year. They are the clinical social workers and the certified nurse midwives. So if you find yourself belonging to any of the clinician types that I just mentioned, you got to follow to step number two. All right. So afterwards, you got to check the following. First, you got to check to see if you were enrolled as a Medicare provider before January 1 of 2022. If yes, then proceed to the next thing, which is ask yourself if you exceed the low volume threshold, either as an individual or as a group. And first, let us define what is the low volume threshold. It means that you bill more than 90,000 for the Part B covered professional services under the physician fee schedule and you see more than 200 Part B patients, and also you provide more than 200 covered professional services to Part B patients. So notice I said and and not or, so you gotta have all these three criteria met in order to exceed the low volume threshold. And the last thing is you gotta not be a qualifying alternative payment model participant. 
So this is the pathway we mentioned, uh, which is the APM. If you will be reporting on APM, you will not be required to report on MIPS. And you, in order to be reporting on MIPS and not APM, you got to be not qualified as an as a QP uh, or as a participant of the APM, which means that you do not receive at least 50% of the Medicare Part B payments, or you do not see at least 35% of Medicare patients through an advanced APM entity. All right, next slide, please, Kim. Uh, so if you are eligible to report, whereas uh, all the criteria we mentioned, you match them, you can check to see whether you will be reporting as an individual or as a group. If you meet all the mentioned criteria we mentioned, then you will, can report as an individual. You will be eligible to report as an individual. But if you meet all the criteria except the low volume threshold, then you will be eligible to report as a group, but not as an individual. All right. Still, so if you're not eligible to report either as an individual or as a group, but you feel like you want to opt in, uh, you can do so. If you meet all the criteria except uh, the low volume threshold, you meet only one or two of the low volume threshold and not the three, you can opt in to report for MIPS as an individual. All right. So this was the science behind it, how the eligibility is determined. But in order to check yourself, this, there is a super easy way. You can check uh, the QPP website, which is qpp.cms.gov. And once you go to the website, you will find a greenish blue box on the top left corner as displayed here on the slide. And this box, you will have um, a box that says MPI number. You will be required to insert your MPI number and click on the check status. Uh, when you click on check status, it would show you your eligibility, whether you are eligible to report or not for MIPS. The results will be shown as one of the following here on the slide. Either you are MIPS eligible for both uh, as an individual or as a group. As you see here, both are highlighted in green. This means that you will be eligible to report either as an individual or as a group. Uh, or it would be shown that you are eligible only to report as a group. This is the one that is highlighted also in green, but individual, as you see, it's not highlighted. So you will then be not be eligible to report as an individual. All right. So this was about the eligibility. Uh, once you determine whether you're eligible or not, and you found that you are eligible and you want to start reporting, uh, you got to know how does the scoring for MIPS work. Um, so the scoring for MIPS is done uh, throughout the year. So this year, 2022, the scoring for MIPS is um, dependent on your performance for the year 2022. And according to your uh, performance, you get gra granted points from a zero to 100. And according to the points you get, you either get an incentive or a deduction or a neutral payment adjustment. And this payment adjustment uh, gets applied to you two years after the performance year which means that for the year 2022, the payment adjustment is going to be applied in the year 2024. All right. So the scoring, as I mentioned, is from 0 to 100. And if you get from 0 to 18.75 points, you get a negative payment adjustment. If you get a score from 18.76 to 74.9, you get a negative payment adjustment between 0 and negative 9. Uh, when you reach the 75 points, then that means you get neither a deduction nor an incentive. That is the neutral payment adjustment. Starting the from 75.01 and until 100, this is where you get an incentive. But it is classified into two categories. If you score from 75.01 until 88.9, you get the normal positive payment adjustment that CMS sets. But if you score from 89 to 100, you are then considered an exceptional performer and you get the incentive that CMS sets plus an extra incentive since you are then considered an exceptional performer. All right, next slide, please. So uh, the scoring for MIPS, how does it work or what does it score? 
So MIPS consists of four categories and you've got to score a grade at all of them in order to get the maximum points you can get and get the incentive you're aiming for. All right, the categories of MIPS are as follows. First, we've got the quality. It contributes with 30% of the MIPS score. Then we've got the cost. It contributes with 30% as well. Then we've got improvement activities. This uh, is 15% of the MIPS final score. And finally, we've got the promoting interoperability. That is 25% of the MIPS final score. Next slide, please. Okay, let's first start with the quality. And you've got to know that this category requires the most work during the year. Uh, this category contributes with 30% of the final score. And the purpose of this category is uh, to assess the quality of care you deliver to your patients. And it's done through a set of measures that QPP created with the help of other medical professional and stakeholder groups. And um, this category has a maximum score of 60 points. So in order to get the whole 30 points of the MIPS final score, you've got to score the 60 out of 60 points in this category. Uh, as mentioned, this category consists of measures, and you got to pick six measures. Each measure would be out of 10 points. In order to get the full 60 points, you got to score 10 out of 10 in all of the six measures. Okay, so the requirements, the exact requirements for the quality category is first to pick your six measures from the QPP website. And the six measures you pick, they got to have at least one of them, an outcome measure, or if there isn't any outcome measure available on the website that relates to your specialty, you can replace it by a high priority measure. And then the six measures you pick, you got to collect the data on them for the whole year, the whole 12 month period from January 1 until December 31. And try to be uh, like conclusive to pick data for all the patients that are related to every measure. But CMS uh, has released that data completeness starts from 70%. So if you collect data on only 70% of the patients you saw throughout the year, this will also still be acceptable. So on the QPP website, you will find a total of 200 quality measures for you to pick from. And there are some tips you gotta keep in mind while picking the measures. Each measure you pick should have the following. First, it gotta have a benchmark. Um, what defines benchmark is that when a measure has a benchmark, it means that it's scored from one to 10. If you put in the, all the work you can and you meet, or you get all your patients to meet the requirements for the measure, you will get the full 10 points. But if a measure doesn't have a benchmark, then it means that no matter how much work you put in the measure, you will only get three points. So this is really important when you get to pick your measures so that you don't have to put in a lot of work and then not get points for it. The second thing is you gotta make sure that each measure you pick, you have at least 20 cases seen during the year relatable to the measure. And finally, you gotta make sure that measures are easily embedded in your workflow so that you will not have to put in extra work or that it won't burden you during the year. In order to check the benchmarks, uh, which is really important and I truly recommend before you pick your measures, uh, you can check this link here. It would download a folder from the QPP website. Check the file that is called 2022 MIPS Historical Quality Benchmarks, and then you can check to see whether a measure has a benchmark or not. All right, so this was for the quality category. Moving forward to the promoting interoperability category, which contributes with 25% of the final score. The purpose of this category is to improve the patient access to their health information improve the exchange of information between healthcare providers and to improve the systemic collection and analysis of the data. This is done throughout the measures of the promoting interoperability that we will discuss soon enough. Uh, in order to meet, to meet this measure, you got to first make sure that you have a 2015 edition certified electronic health record technology, which LITIC is. And you got to make sure that you pick only 90 days of the year, starting from January 1 until December 31, you can pick in any 90 consecutive days, which are three months, and uh, collect the data and report the measure in this period. QPP had released some 
category of clinicians that they get an automatic reweighting of the promoting interoperability category because for the QPP thinks that for some people this measure is tough to report on. So they did the automatic reweighting for these people. You can check yourself to see if you belong to the uh, clinician types here. And also you got to check to see if you belong to any of the special statuses here mentioned, but I got to highlight that this year it's added the small practices. It's so that it means if you belong to a small practice, you can then get the automatic reweighting for the promoting interoperability. And the small practice is defined as a practice that contains less than 15 practitioners. Okay. Okay. So also, if you still think that you want to report on the PI, the promoting interoperability, you can still do so even with the automatic reweighting there. By submitting the data at the end of the year, you will then uh, get the automatic reweighting re cancelled and you will get the points for the promoting interoperability measure. Okay, so the promoting interoperability consists of four sections. Uh, first, we've got the e-prescribing section. This is related to the electronic prescription of medications. Then we've got the health informational exchange. This is related to the exchange of data between one provider and another, and it's mainly um, for the transition of care to ease the transition of care of the patients from one clinician to another. Thirdly, we've got the provider to patient exchange. This relates to the access of the patient to their health information uh, through the patient portal. And finally, we've got the public health and clinical data exchange. This relates to your sending the information of some of your patients and being part of clinical trials that are held by the public health registries and the clinical data registries uh, in your state. Okay. So this was it, was it for the promoting interoperability category. Then we've got the improvement activities category. This one contributes with 15% of the final score of the MIPS. And the purpose of this category is that by implementing the activities that you pick, this would improve the care you give to your patients. For this category, you've got to also pick any 90 consecutive days throughout the year. And also, it does not have to be the same 90 days as the promoting interoperability. So it can be the same or it can be different, whichever would be fit for you. So as a quick reminder, the quality category, you've got to pick, got to pick the data for the whole year. But for the promoting interoperability and the improvement activities, you can just report on 90 consecutive days, which are three months. The maximum score for this category is 40 points. Um, so in order to get the full 15% of the final score for this category, you got to get 40 out of 40. And the measures are on the website categorized into medium weighted and high weighted. The medium weighted category uh, measures, they are out of 10 points. So if you want to pick only medium weighted categories, you got to uh, measures, you got to pick four measures in order to meet the category score. If you would pick the high-weighted activities, then you got to pick uh, two because one of them is out of 20 points. You can also mix, mix between the medium-weighted and the high-weighted, which means you can pick one high-weighted and two medium-weighted. If you belong to the, any of the special statuses, which are uh, the belonging to a rural area or a health professional shortage area, if you are non-patient facing or you belong to a small practice, you get double uh, the points for each of the measures, which means you get 20 points for medium weighted activities and 40 points for the one high weighted activity. So you can report on only two medium weighted or one high weighted activity. Finally, we've got the co cost category and this category contributes with 30% of your final score. The purpose of this category is to uh, measure the overall cost of care you provide to your Medicare patients with a focus on the primary care they received. Okay, so you got to know that for this measure, you don't have to do any work. You don't have to submit any data. QPP uh, measures your score dependent on the claims you submit throughout the year for your patients. And so the only advice I've got for you for this category is just to be as specific as possible with your diagnosis code that you use. And then QPP would then determine your score uh, based upon that. There are various cost measures available. 
and QPP determines the measures that are related to you and to your specialty. You get scored on a scale from one to 10 points uh, for each measure. And, and if you find yourself meeting only one cost measure, then this is the measure you get scored upon. If, you, if there are various cost measures that are, uh, you are eligible for, you get scored upon them. If you're not eligible for any of the cost measures, then it's fine. QPP then reweights this category so that you get zero points for the cost and all the points of the cost would be moved to the other MIPS categories. All right, so this was our quick glimpse about MIPS. You can check more and learn more about it through visiting the resource library QPP provides and also by visiting our website and check the macro section we've got there. Now, moving to the last section of our quick MIPS glimpse, we will see how LightTech would help you in reporting for MIPS. So as we mentioned, the MIPS contains four categories and here we will check to see how LightTech would help you in each of them. For the quality category, after we pick the measures that are most eligible for you and that are the easiest for you to report on, you can easily report on them using the LightTech MD system. And uh, we would customize the system for you so that the measures are all reportable through it. We will add quick text in your notes so that it would be easy for you to click on them when you see a patient that is eligible for a measure. And also we can run reports to see the patients you might have missed on, and then we can easily go back and correct them if you had, had not done that. Then for the promoting interoperability category, as we mentioned, should have patient access to their health information, and this is available in LightTech through the patient portal. There is also the direct messaging that LightTech MD provides so that you can chat with any of the other healthcare providers and send them information about your patient that you require transition of care or you receive the transition of care for them. And finally, there is the availability of electronic prescription through LightTech MD as well. For the improvement activity category, after you pick the measures, you can easily also get them customized in your system for you to report on them. And we will create clickable text for the measures in your notes for you to click on so that you can easily meet uh, the requirements for the measure for all your patients that are eligible. Finally, for the cost category, uh, as we mentioned, you don't have to submit any data. You just get a, gotta make sure that you bill your patients and send the claims, and you can always easily do that through our lighting billing system to bill all your patients. Uh, next slide, please. So this was it for today for me. Do you have any questions? Hi, it doesn't look like we have any questions from our audience. Let me move back to our slide of what our agenda is. All right. Thank you, Kim. Okay. Thank you so much, Yasmin. Okay, so the other two um, categories that we have is the secondary billing overview and useful payment reports. Um, Robert, are you with us? Yes, I am. Uh, why, why don't you do the secondary claims uh, and I will do the reports. Okay, so as far as um, secondary billing is concerned, this portion is really going to be dependent upon what types of insurance carriers you're billing to. So if we are doing Medicare billing or if we're just doing straight commercial billing, if we don't submit to Medicare at all, it is going to give us a difference in how we handle our secondaries. So LIHTC does have the ability of obviously printing our claims and we can also submit um, electronic secondaries as well if the insurance carriers accept them, um, which most of our carriers do accept them now. If we are doing Medicare billing, there are a lot of carriers that Medicare will cross over our secondary claims to. So it would be a good step to identify which of the carriers they are forwarding to so that we know which secondary claims we would need to send them out to. And if we are doing straight commercial for all of those, um, we really would need to send our secondary claims out in order to receive payment for that. And it is a very important step in the billing process as well. So secondaries will cover quite a few things for our patients, depending upon the plans that they sign up for. 
So if we are not sending out secondaries, we could be missing out on quite a bit of money coming from those plans. So whether it's deductibles or co-insurances or even just co-payments, those types of dollar amounts will add up after a while, even if it is only maybe five, ten dollars a claim. Um, so we do want to make sure that we're always following up and sending out those secondary claims to make sure that we are collecting as much as we potentially can from our insurance carriers. But that is something that you would want to make sure of. And we can use the we can use the AR tracker in LIHTC as well to kind of follow up on that and make sure that our secondaries are being sent out and that they're being paid. So similar, similarly to how we use it for our primary follow-up, you can filter for our secondaries and just make sure that we're getting all of that out to the actual insurance carriers themselves. Did we have anybody that had any questions regarding sending secondary claims, any issues that you have with it? Okay, so there's two there's two reports I, I wanted to share with you today uh, or remind you about today is I think they're very essential. Uh, and, and all the way at the footer, I have where those reports come from. So that, that's a monthly summary, and this comes from the executive practice summary in LIHTC. And what I love so much about this report, it just breaks it down by provider and and it kind of gives you the total number of claims or number of patient or, or billing. Then it, it gives you the iterations and it gives you how much. Now, this is just a dummy data. This is hopefully you will see a, a much better data here. It, it, uh, it tells you how much you have in AR and how long they've been sitting in the AR. So as everybody know, the AR starts counting as you send the billing out. And if you don't get paid after one day, the AR is one day and, and the next day is two days in AR. Until you get paid, then it gets off the AR or the account receivable. And it's important to, you know, that this report just shows you by provider, how is each provider is doing as far as how much they bill and how much they collect and how much they get paid and how much setting in the AR. Okay, so that's the first report. The second report, that one, we do give it as a bonus uh, for if you are on the cloud. So if you don't have it and you have a need for it and you do have our Lightech cloud, we would love to share it with you. So this is a report package. It comes with about 20 additional reports uh, that you don't normally have in Lightech and they come with the Lightech cloud. And uh, this is my favorite out of all of them. This is what I love so much about this one. This also gives you now the breakdown. It gives it to you by uh, by insurance. It shows you how many claims in each insurance, what is the percentage of charge for each of your payer, and what is the dollar amount, and then how much you get paid from each payer and how much you adjust because you could be billing a thousand dollar and and collecting ten dollars and you're adjusting nine hundred and ninety dollars then you know you you're not collect you adjusting too much money from each payer so this report kind of gives you that dashboard overlook of over the health of all your payers so, and what's so important about this because some some providers are so busy seeing patients and they don't step back and look at the the overall health of that practice especially let's say if you have medicare advantage where medicare advantage they play so many games with uh, medicare and and provider might be thinking oh i'm seeing a medicare patient but indeed, you're not really seeing a Medicare patient. And, and this is a commercial insurance, got a contract for Medicare, and you subject to all the game and, and games that they might play on you. And you wanted to make sure that your overall health of your practice is, is sound and profitable because after all, it's a business. And, and as a business, we all need to make sure it's healthy because that's how we feed our family and how we feed our staff and how we uh, we stay in business. So you want to make sure that each payer is bringing the the amount of money that you're expecting, and you're not over you're not adjusting too much for whatever reason, and you are getting paid the uh, appropriate amount of payment or what's you might have expected. So this just gives you the overall. Um, vital signs of your practice.
with that is that we'll um, end today's seminar. Uh, we will be, so this is my contact information. If you're watching this later on and you want to email me or call me direct, uh, here's my contact information. I want to thank you so much for taking the valuable time out of your busy schedule. And thank you so much for your business. Uh, have a wonderful day. And thank you, Kim. And, and thank you, Yasmin. Bye-bye. Thank you, everybody. Have a great day. Thank you, Robert. Have a great day.